Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Financial Life After Mohawk webinar. This webinar is part of the Career Ready by Alumni uh, Spring Series. My name is Lindsay Diamond, and I am an alumni coordinator at Mohawk College. I'm so glad that everyone can join us today, and I look forward to learning alongside everyone. I know there's a lot of great material today to cover, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters, Brittany Fleming and Deb Clinton. Brittany Fleming is a Mohawk is a money coach for Mohawk College's Mo Money Financial Literacy Resource Center. She hosts webinars and events, as well as one-on-one -on -one financial counseling sessions for students. Previous to working at Mohawk, she worked at Meridian Credit Union as a financial service advisor. Brittany has also supported international students as a student advisor and registrar at the International Language School of Canada. Brittany earned a Bachelor of Commerce in Business Management and, Enterpre and Entrepreneurship from Ryerson University, a Personal Finance Financial Planning Postgrad Certificate from Humber College, and is Investment Funds in Canada certified. When not working at the college, Brittany enjoys camping, biking, and hiking on all of the Hamilton trails, playing with her two cats, ham and cheese. <laughs> which I thought are very clever names. <laughs> Deb Clinton is a communications and programming specialist for Mohawk College's Mo Money Financial Literacy Resource Center uh, Department. She is responsible for researching financial literacy resources, facilitating workshops, organizing special events, and managing Mo Money social media accounts. So start following them today. Deb is a proud Mohawk alumni and a lifelong learner. She has obtained multiple certificates in project management, international association for business part participation, and the Canadian Institution of Management. Deb has spent the majority of her career working in the local provincial slash municipal levels of government, providing community de development, neighborhood engagement, project management, and public speaking. As a mother of two adult children, Deb, when not working at the college, enjoys a round of golf, growing things in her garden, and constantly training her four-month-old puppy, Jasper. Yeah. Brittany and Deb, thank you so much for, for being here today and for giving us your time. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to you guys. Great. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And I want to say... Um, you know, congratulations to the folks that are joining us today for um, the completion of their studies. Um, so today, Brittany and I are going to share some information um, and sources of information uh, related to OSAP loans and debt management. So we are not experts in OSAP, um, but we'll give you a broad overview of the program. Um, so we have provided Lindsay with a resource sheet that she's going to share with you as well as uh, the presentation. So I suggest that you look at that resource sheet and use it, uh, you know, when it when it's good, good timing for you. So if you um, if you have a student loan, you're certainly not alone. 73% um, of Mohawk students rely on OSAP. Now, according to Stats Canada, across the country, 82% of college graduates have loans um, from different government sources. Uh, now, uh, the, in 2018, there was a national graduate survey done, and that collected information from all post-secondary grads uh, in the year 2015. And in that year, the average, um, the average debt at graduation for students was $15,000, which is pretty significant. So like, if you are like most graduates, you are graduating with a student loan. So it's important to keep your National Student Loan Service Center account up to date. You will re be required to start repaying your loan after six months after completing full-time studies. So at this time, after those six months, your loans start to collect interest. So I, as a note, students with an OSAP loan who are enrolled in a program or continuing full-time studies uh, with a new OSAP loan, uh, that will automatically maintain an interest-free status. Um, so it's not until you're finished uh, studying 
that you'll start accruing interest on your loans. <clears throat> so the National Student Loan Service Canada will reach out to you via email before your six month non repayment period ends to prompt you to set up your loan payment options. It's great that you have loan payment options because everybody's situation is different and, and one size doesn't fit all. So if you have means at any time uh, you, to put down a lump sum on your loan, uh, that would be a great idea to do because uh, once you put a lump sum on your loan, you, um, it, it reduces the interest that you will owe. Um, and also at this time, um, when you log on, you'll be able to manage um, how you make your payments. So part of managing your payments is picking a monthly date. So uh, you'll be able to choose, um, choose a date monthly uh, to have that loan taken out of your account. And most people choose a date um, where they know that they will either be getting paid or that they will have some, you know, they will have enough funds in their account to make the payment. Um, you can also have them automatically deducted from your account, or you can set it up where um, the National Loan Service is a payee and you can go in and manually pay them. But most people opt for the automatic deduction. Uh, this is the easiest way that you're not going to miss a payment. And the most important thing is, is just to make sure you have enough money in your account on that day. Um, so you can even arrange to have your payments calculated on a weekly or biweekly basis. And this will help you pay down your principal amount of your loan. And like I said earlier, this is going to make you pay less interest in the long haul, which is important. So you can also choose uh, whether to have a fixed interest rate or a floating interest rate. Um, NSLSE will by def default give you a floating interest rate if you do not specify which one you want. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the best option for you. So a fixed interest rate is calculated um, to be the prime rate set by the Bank of Canada plus 2%. So I checked today and the prime rate today is 2.45%. So if you were going to go with a fixed rate, you would be looking at a 4.45% interest rate over a term. Now, the benefit of a fixed rate is that it's stable and predictable. You know how much it's going to be monthly and you can plan and budget accordingly. <clears throat> a floating interest rate is equal to the prime rate, which is 2.45. So, and so it's much lower, right? It's 2% lower. So the prime rate is subject to be changed by the Bank of Canada at any time. So a floating rate is considered a bit risky because it's subject to the economy and factors beyond our control. Um, However, you can start with a floating rate if that's what you prefer, and then you can change it to a fixed rate as your income becomes more stable or um, you get into a budget scenario and you're comfortable. However, once you change your rate from floating to fixed, you can't go back. So now this is new. So effective April 2021, the government of Canada has eliminated interest on the Canada student loans until March 31st, 2022. Um, now this is just applicable to the federal portion of your student loan, um, but still that's, that, that's significant. And there is a bill in parliament that to look at extending that until March 31st, 2023. So uh, you can log on to your account Account and get these notifications. It's good to, like I said, keep checking because thing, new things happen all the time. So it's important to remember that you can always increase or decrease your monthly payments to suit your budget. So, you know, you can go in and you can manage those things on your account. Um, however, noting that decreasing your payment will increase the amount of time it will take to pay off your loan. So if you miss a loan payment for more than nine months, your loan falls into default and is transferred to the Canada Revenue Agency. You hear the bells? That's my dog, okay? He's not well-trained. 
Um, if this happens, you are at risk of racking up heavy penalties. It will affect your credit score. Um, CRA has the power. Oh, he doesn't really want to. <laughs> um, CRA has the power to withhold your income tax refund, garnish your wages, and seize assets. This, of course, can also have a negative impact on your credit rating, uh, applying for mag mortgages, credit cards, and even if you're applying to rent uh, a place, they make you fill out an application. And if they check your credit rating, it, it can affect your, your possibility of, of, of finding a place to live. So if you ever find yourself in a position where you're struggling to make your loan payment, there are options. And in the next few slides, I'm going to explain those for you. So um, the one, one of the options is a one-year non-repayment period for entrepreneurs. So if you are an owner or joint owner of an eligible new business in Ontario, you can get an extra six months of non-repayment period um, before you have to start repaying the Ontario portion um, of your student loan. So um, eligibility is, is that you um, have left full-time school within the last six months. You have full-time OSAP loans, uh, not currently in repayment status. You are the sole owner or joint owner of an eligible new business in Ontario, and you are currently working for that business for 30 hours per week. So the new business has to be uh, registered with the CRA, at least within the current calendar year or within the two previous calendar years. So then the next option is the one year non repayment period for not for profit employees. So this extension works very similar to the entrepreneur scenario. If you are working 30 plus hours for a not for profit organization, and you have full time loans that are not currently in repayment status, you could be eligible for up to a six month non repayment period. Both you and the not-for-profit organization you work for have to complete sections of an application, and the organization must confirm that you meet the eligibility criteria. And so they, part of that eligible, <laughs> eligibility criteria is that they have a registered charitable number or a not-for-profit corporation number. So then the next one is the repayment assistance plan, which is called RAP. So depending on your income, you may not be required to make a loan payment that exceeds 20% of your income. It also allows for income, income thresholds for family size. Now you can apply for this assistance anytime during the repayment period. Um, if you are eligible, the Bank of Canada and Ontario will pay the interest owing um, that your revised payment does not cover. So, in order to remain eligible, you have to reapply every six months. So it is something that you'll have to keep doing if your income is low. Um, and part of the eligibility criteria is, is that you reside in Canada, that your loans are already in repayment. So you, you're six months past grad and your loan payments are up to date. So you can't have missed a payment. So then the next, my puppy's going to join us. <laughs> I see you. Um, so then the next one is the repayment assistance plan for borrowers with a permanent disability. So this assistance program is designed for individuals that may have a longer term financial setback due to illness or disability. The same financial thresholds as the RAP, RAP program apply. And the main difference is, is that there are medical forms required and it has to be assessed and deemed eligible by the National Loan Service. So then the next slide um, is if you're continuing your full-time studies, just because you're graduating from a program now doesn't mean that you're finished school. And I think we can all attest to that. You know, uh, we're lifelong learners and we continue to do things. And so many graduates decide um, that they're going to continue their studies at Mohawk, go to university, or even study abroad. So if you're planning on continuing your education, either here or somewhere else, you have more options other than OSAP. 
<laughs> Each year, uh, Mohawk College awards millions of dollars in scholarships and bursaries to assist our students. Uh, Mohawk College offers two types of financial awards to students, scholarships and bursaries. Now, scholarships are awarded to students based on academic merit, athletics, volunteer experience, or other achievements. Bursaries award, are awarded to students who demonstrate financial need. Um, and they, are, they're, they may be financial need, but there also may be other criteria. Um, there are a number of awards available through agencies also external to Mohawk. And these awards are listed on your resource sheet um, with links um, to the appropriate websites. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's a great idea. There's lots of uh, scholarships and bursaries out there in the community through individuals and corporations. The thing is, is that Mohawk College doesn't endorse these. We don't, you know, we'll give you the links to look at them, um, but we really have no, um, no liability in terms of managing them. So, uh, you know, take a look at them, but we're not involved in that. So then if you are a part-time student through the Mohawk Continuing Education Program, you, uh, there are financial assistance uh, programs uh, that are available, including OSAP, Mohawk Bursaries, and external um, you know, uh, continuing education awards. So if you're enrolled in a program between 20% of your time or 59% uh, of your course load, uh, you may be eligible for part-time funding for educational costs through OSAB. Uh, however, eligible students must apply for funding on a term-by-term -term basis. Um, and on our website, we have an application process that takes you step-by-step, -step, so it's very easy and very intuitive. Um, our continuing education part-time student bursaries are, are given on a need base. So if you're receiving funding or awards from other sources, it may reduce or eliminate your eligibility to receive a bursary. So our website, again, like I said, is really robust. It offers step-by-step -step guides on how to apply for these, for the awards, the bursaries, the scholarships, and even OSAP. But then one um, sort of final thing, too, is that uh, often employers will offer professional development funds for their employees. So if your field of education is relevant to the work that you're doing, many employers will pay for your courses and compensate for your time to take them. So if you're looking at, you know, going for job interviews, this is always a great question to ask your employers is what do they offer in terms of a professional development fund and take advantage of it because you can earn, you know, uh, further degrees or take, uh, you know, courses that are going to improve, you know, your, your employability along the road. So it's a great program to, to, to get. Right. So now I'm going to pass the torch over to Brittany, who's going to highlight some valuable information on how you can manage debt, uh, manage your savings and build wealth. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Uh, so as Deb mentioned in my section, we're going to be talking about debt, savings and wealth building. So first we'll talk about managing and paying down your debt and then growing your savings and then building wealth through various ways like financial investments, mortgages, and a bit about retirement at the end. So let's start off by talking about managing your debt. The key to managing your debt is to first avo avoid taking on more debt. So when you take on more and different kinds of, kinds of debt, you add or raise the payments that you have to make each month in the future. Doing this takes away from future earnings because you have to pay back what you've already purchased in the past plus interest. Of course, not taking on more debt can be hard to do, especially when you're first starting out in a career after college, but anything you can avoid adding to your debt load will help you in the future. Try to live within your means. So this means that what you spend each month is less than or at least equal to the amount of money that you bring in each month. If it's less, then you'll be able to build your savings for unexpected purchases and emergencies. Building these safety nets are crucial to avoid adding more debt in the future. Accidents, emergencies, and the unexpected will always happen, but we can be prepared by saving for them in advance. So beyond taking on, beyond to avoiding taking on more debt, you should also take care of the debt that you already have. 
This means knowing what you owe. Knowing your total debt load will help you see your financial, your current financial picture more clearly and help you make financial decisions. Make a list of your total debts and include the creditor, the total amount of debt, the monthly minimum payment, interest rate, and the due date. It may help to have your due dates written on a calendar to keep yourself organized. You can also set up automatic withdrawals for most payments and automatic bill payments for the ones that you can't. Also, ensure you pay a few days before the due date and always, always make your minimum payments for credit cards and lines of credit. When creating goals around debt, ensure your goals are realistic and can be achieved within a desired timeline. So if you already have a debt load and are wondering what to pay down first, there are two methods for deciding this. There's the snowball method and then there's the avalanche method. If you owe any collections, that should be the first thing you pay down. You'll wanna settle that balance first. Then you can choose between snowball and avalanche. So let's assume that you have some extra money to pay down your debts beyond the minimum payments. It's pretty great, right? But how do you choose what to pay down first? In both methods, you make the minimum payments. The methods just tell you which, where to put the extra money. So let's look at them. In the debt snowball, you list all of your debts from smallest to largest amounts. In the debt avalanche, you list your debts according to the interest rate. The goal is to pay less interest overall. In both scenarios, you then devote the extra money each month to paying off the first debt first, and you only make minimum payments on the others. Then when the first balance is paid off, you move on to the next one, adding that money and so on. So if you're not sure of the interest rate you're paying, you can check your monthly statement for that account. Usually credit cards, especially store credit cards, have the highest interest rates. Lines of credit and loans all have varying interest rates, so checking your statement is the best way. So the easiest way to save is to build your savings into your budget. And the way to do that is to think of your savings like you do other expenses. Irregular expenses are costs that come up throughout the year that you don't need to budget for, or that you need to budget for, sorry, you need to. <laughs> uh, if you don't, you'll probably find yourself reaching for a credit card when those expenses come up. Instead, you can save for these expenses in advance and not feel guilty when you, plan, when you spend the money. Consider it planned spending. So some examples of irregular expenses include property taxes, home or car insurance, if you pay quarterly or annually, uh, clothing or shoes, if you don't shop every week, uh, health expenses, vet bills, gifts, and car maintenance. You probably also have savings goals uh, for retirement, a down payment on a home, a trip, or for emergencies. So make sure you have included these goal-oriented savings into your budget as well. To figure out how much to set aside each month, first you need to know how much you need to save, when you need to save it by, and divide by the number of months you have left until that date. This will indicate how much you need to save each month. These types of savings are not meant to be touched until that event happens. If there's one thing that the pandemic has taught us, it's the, emerg the need for emer an emergency fund. The size of your emergency fund will depend on various factors, but when you're just starting out, the key is to have enough stashed away to make you feel comfortable. Start with a goal of about $500 to avoid using your credit card. Then build it up to include several months of expenses should an emergency happen. Like all savings, it may be helpful to set up automatic transfers and have separate accounts just for saving. So once you have a plan for your debt and you have your savings expenses in order, and have built an emergency fund, now you may find yourself with more money at the end of the month. So what do you do with those funds? Now you start to invest in your long-term future and start building wealth. Wealth is built through various investments, including financial investments and mortgages, so that you can use your wealth to retire and maybe pass something along to future generations. So we'll start by looking at some investment terms. On this slide are some common types of investments. All have various risks associated with them. Some have a higher risk than others. It's important to find a financial advisor who can help you decide which investments are right for you. GICs are generally low risk, while individual stocks can be more risky. From my experience working at a bank, I would say that GICs and mutual funds are the most common types of investments. But where do you put GICs, mutual funds, and other investments? You can put them in general savings accounts, but there are also other types of savings accounts that hold investments and savings, TFSAs and RRSPs. 
You maybe have heard these terms before, but let's dive in and see what each one is about. So a TFSA is a type of savings account for Canadian residents who are 18 and over with a social insurance number. Earnings within the TFSA are not taxed. You can have savings accounts and investments within the TFSA, and you can have multiple TFSAs. The government limits contribution room, and it is defined by your age, if you're 18 and over and eligible for a TFSA, and number of years as a Canadian resident. So over the last few years, it's been about $6,000. In 2018, it was $5,500. So if you have never contributed to a TFSA and have been eligible since its introduction in 2009, meaning you were over 18 and a Canadian resident then, your cumulative contribution room will be $75,500 in 2021. Now, an RRSP is a type of account meant for long-term retirement savings for Canadian residents with employment income. You can have savings accounts and investments within the RRSP, and you can have multiple RRSPs. The Canada Revenue Agency generally calculates your RRSP deduction limit as follows. It's your unused deduction room at the end of the preceding year, plus the lesser of two of the following items. 18% of your earned income in the previous year up to a limit. And there are other parts of the formula, but to know for sure, check your notice of assessment from your taxes or log in to the CRA website. Generally contributions are taxed at the time of withdrawal, but there are some exceptions like when you purchase a home or if you return to school. Savings and investments may just be part of your wealth building plan. Owning property is another way to build wealth, and so you may be wondering about mortgages. So I'm going to play a short video now that will explain all you need to know about the basics of a mortgage. Buying a house may be the single biggest investment of your life, an investment regularly made possible by a mortgage. But hold on, what exactly is a mortgage? A mortgage is a loan from a bank or other financial institution that allows someone to purchase a house with a down payment. To understand how a mortgage works, let's consider Jen and Chris. Jen and Chris have found their dream house, which is selling for $300,000. They have $50,000 to put toward a down payment, $25,000 from their personal savings, $10,000 from their RRSPs, and $15,000 given to them by their parents as a gift. The outstanding $250,000 is the value of the mortgage required to purchase the house. A mortgage provider will lend Jen and Chris $250,000 in exchange for regular interest and principal payments over an agreed upon period of time. If they buy their house with less than 20% down, their lender will have them also purchase CMHC insurance. This protects the lender if Jen and Chris were unable to make their payments. Gradually, home buyers like Jen and Chris build what's called equity in their home by making regular mortgage payments. As they do, lenders will lose more and more of their stake in Jen and Chris's house. Although all mortgages come with an interest rate attached, home buyers must choose between a fixed or variable mortgage rate. Which you choose will depend on your financial flexibility and your appetite for risk. A fixed rate commits you to a specified interest rate and a fixed monthly payment schedule. With a fixed rate, you know exactly how much you'll be paying each month and you can budget accordingly. This is one of the reasons why people choose fixed rates. Selecting a variable rate, on the other hand, means your mortgage payments will fluctuate with the prime rate, also known as prime lending rate, as set by the Bank of Canada. For example, a rate may be listed as prime minus 0.6% or prime plus 0.2%. Though the relationship to prime stays constant, your interest rate will change as prime fluctuates. People opt for variable rates as they are often lower than fixed rates. They do, however, carry more risk. Prime always has the potential to increase. When selecting a mortgage rate, there is another important variable involved, time. The amortization period is the time a homeowner takes to pay off his entire mortgage. This period can be as long as 35 years. Longer amortization periods allow homeowners to make smaller monthly payments. Keep in mind, however, that the longer a homeowner takes to pay off his mortgage, the more overall interest he'll pay. 
A term is shorter than the amortization period and is the amount of time a home buyer commits to the rules, conditions, and interest rate they have agreed to with their lender. Terms can last anywhere from six months to 10 years, with the average term in Canada lasting close to five years. Many mortgage shoppers will begin at their bank, though banks are not the only place to get a mortgage. Now more than ever, people are turning to independent mortgage brokers for the best advice and most competitive rates. Independent mortgage brokers have access to multiple lenders, including the big banks, so they can find the best mortgage and the most competitive rate for their client. And their services are free as they earn commission from the lender. A competitive broker is able to offer low rates because of the volume of his business. Lenders actually give these brokers interest rate discounts, discounts which are passed directly to their clients. Once you've selected your mortgage provider, you can start the mortgage application process. If you've already bought a house, you are ready to apply for a mortgage. If you're just starting to look, you can apply for a pre-approval. In order to determine if you are eligible for a mortgage, lenders consider three basic things. Your credit rating, your down payment as a percentage of your total home value, and finally, your annual income. Lenders look at your credit rating to determine how good you are at paying your bills on time. Past credit card payments, car payments, and personal loans can all be used to determine your score. The more equity you have invested in your house, i.e. the higher your down payment as a percent of your home's value, the more likely you are to qualify. In Canada, the minimum down payment required is 5%. Finally, the combined annual salary of co-applicants or spouses helps lenders determine which homes and mortgages they can afford. To estimate the size of the mortgage you qualify for, visit our website, ratehub.ca. So the key things to note about mortgages are also here on this slide. The mortgage amount will be the purchase price minus the down payment. So in this example, the purchase price is 700,000. I'm not sure in the video where people, uh, obviously they're not in Ontario at the $300,000 house. Um, so in my example, we have 700,000. Uh, the borrower puts down 140,000 and the mortgage amount is 560,000. Uh, so the Canada Mortgage and Housing Insurance Corporation, or CMHC, has mortgage loan insurance, and that lets you get a mortgage for up to 95% of the purchase price of the home, meaning that you don't need the full 20% as a down payment. You can put as little as 5% of the purchase price, but you have to pay for CMHC mortgage loan insurance for your mortgage. So also, as mentioned in the video, fixed rates provide the same rate for the duration of the term of the mortgage. You can lock in a term for several years, three to five is about typical. With a variable interest rate, your payments will fluctuate a bit depending on the bank rate. So the last point about mortgages is that a pre-approval is a document you get from the bank or financial institution that shows how much you can afford. There are lots of terms and conditions to a pre-approval, so be sure to check those out before bidding on a home. And lastly, uh, what about retirement? So another component of building wealth is usually to use some of your wealth to retire. So here are some early retirement advice that you can take advantage of right when you land your first job. Uh, so definitely take advantage of RSP matching through employers. Uh, this might be something that you have to ask about, um, but usually it's offered pretty, um, pretty widely. So I would definitely talk with your future employers about that. Um, it's never too early to start saving, even for retirement. And uh, of course, as we talked about in the savings section, you can automate your savings as well. And so the most important thing uh, to know is where to look for more information. So a trusted advisor at a bank or credit union or other financial institution will be your first point of contact for future goals, planning for your retirement, buying a home and investments. So meet with several potential advisors. Ask your friends and family if there's an advisor that they recommend. Choose one that you're confident has the experience, expertise, and credentials to help you reach your financial goals. You can also book a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me to discuss any of these topics that we talked about here. And we can also talk about credit, budgeting, and future goal planning. And we will also provide you with a resource sheet that has many links to online resources that will give you a lot of information, but in digestible ways. 
So we just wanted to wrap things up by giving you a few takeaways that we hope you got from our presentation. And they are first, that you can tailor your OSAP repayment options for you. Two, if you're having trouble paying back your OSAP, there is help. Three, start paying down debt, collections first, credit cards, loans after. Start saving, build an emergency fund, have savings expenses in your budget. And five, begin building your wealth, investments, mortgages, and retirement. Um, thank you so much, uh, Brittany and Deb. We really appreciate you taking, taking the time out of your day and sharing your insights. I know I personally learned a lot and I plan on going back through and, and re-watching this, this webinar. Um, as mentioned earlier, we will share the recording of this webinar as well as the resource sheet with everyone. Um, so check your email in a couple days. Um, Mohawk Alumni hosts a number of events throughout the year, such as trivia nights, personal uh, and professional development webinars, family-friendly events, some networking events, virtual career workshops. We host a wide variety of events. So please keep an eye on our website posted here on the screen and follow us on social media at Mohawk Alumni. Thank you everyone for joining us today and for staying connected with Mohawk. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, I hope you get out and enjoy some sunshine. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay.